You know, I want to say thank you so much to everyone who uh, came today. To uh, I know some showed up just to uh, be able to see uh, Sadie's baby dedication. I'm not exactly sure that it's much of a baby dedication anymore because, well, she big, yeah. She's a, she's officially a toddler, and uh, yeah. Mallory had a big boo. <laughs> she's just sitting there laughing. She just started crying. I, I'm like snitch on her a little bit. She's just sitting there in the office, and everything's all hunky-dory. We're fine. And then all of a sudden, Mallory's just over there crying. And I was like, oh, God, what did I do now? And, uh, and she's like, I was like, what's wrong? And she's like, I'm going to stay down for sleep, and tomorrow she won't be an infant anymore. And I'm like, okay. Let's just all take a deep breath. Uh, <laughs> but then it just got me thinking about, like, how quick time has gone. And how thankful I am of everything that God has blessed me for, uh, with and for my family and everything. And so I just appreciate everybody who's here to came to, to, to see that and be a part of that. But I don't believe that God brings anybody to any church and any service and any morning for, without a purpose. Amen? Now, you might show up for a different purpose, but my God has a purpose in store. Amen? So this morning, um, you know, just bear with me. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. This week I struggled... Uh, to, to get this sermon together, I've told multiple people this, it's like sometimes I feel like God is just clear and direct, and then sometimes I think that he just wants to stress me out. Um, he's good at the second one a lot, but you know what, sometimes it's not about my timing, about what I need, but it's about God's timing, amen? And, uh, and I appreciate him for that. Um, but the, day I, I, the, the question just kept coming to me this week, and, uh, and so this is just what we're going to start. The question that was coming to me, is that it says, what are you looking for? And um, it got me really thinking about the church and, and us today. And God brought to my, to my spirit this week, he said, are we searching for God or are we searching for the things of God? And it got me really thinking about what's really the difference. Because I think that we live in a world and a church and in a society that doesn't understand what it means to really and truly search for God. Because we're constantly searching for the things of God. We go off and we live these lives and we do all these things and, and, and whatnot. And then we pray, God, I need you to do this and that and this and the other. But are we searching for God to do what God needs to do? Or are we searching for God to do what we want him to do? And so today I want you to think about that because uh, I know it's kind of a loaded question. But uh, we really need to have a heart check at some point. I don't think our society would look the way that our society looks if we were all seeking after God instead of seeking after the things of God. You know, we've got problems in, in our churches. We've got church doors closing left and right. We can't stop bickering with one denomination or the other of who's right and who's wrong. We can't stop with just all the fighting and all this nonsense, and that's just in the church house. Could you imagine if every church house was searching for God himself instead of searching for the things of God? We pray, God, I want you to fill my, my pews. God, I want you to fill my church. But instead, we should be saying, God, I want you to fill the souls that are there to go out and reach and fill the kingdom of God. I'll tell you right now, I'm Pentecostal. I understand that. I'm a little hoopla and all that. But I don't care if you serve the same God I do. We're seeking after the same God. We have to stop all of this stuff. So, so what does it really mean to seek after God? I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, I'll give you all a second to get there. I hear pages turning. Oh, it's a beautiful sound. Amen. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, Jesus was talking here about Christians in general, right? He, he was talking about how we shouldn't be so worried about everything that comes tomorrow, everything that, that is going on. We shouldn't be worried about those things because God takes care of everything. But he says that there's an obligation that we have to do here. And for all that to work, we have to seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all those things will be added unto you. See, I think the problem is, is that we sometimes get the idea that we seek God, but we don't seek him first. <laughs> oh, 
we think, well, God, you know, if I, if I do all this X, Y, and Z, and then I'm like, oh, everything's gone down the drain, well, God, now I'm going to seek you so that you can fix my problem, and then, God, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to be like, all right, well, God, you can fix this now. And then when God fixes it, what do we do? We say, well, all right, God, I got this again. And so today I want us to think about that because what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? And first we have to start with what does it mean to seek? Um, so I'm going to break this down just a little bit. How many have ever played hide and seek? <laughs> so y'all know what it means to seek, all right? When you play in hide and seek, the person who is it has to go and they have to count. Generally they cheat, all right? One, seven, you know? You count, people count really fast when it comes to hide and seek. You're like, all right, you got three minutes. And then 30 seconds later, they're like, all right, here I come. But when the person is seeking for somebody, they don't stop looking until everybody is found. See, this definition that I pulled up the other day, um, I want to, I want to, I want to correctly say it. So they don't stop looking. So for us to seek would be to continually be absorbed in a search for something or making a long, consistent effort to obtain something. We must actively, day in and day out, be seeking for God if we want to see the results that we want to see in our life of God. See, the problem is, is if the hide and seeker just found the first person and they went out there and they said, all right, everything's done. See, they go out and they seek for everything. What what I want us to understand is that we can't just seek God for a moment. If we want to truly seek the kingdom of God, we have to day in and day out be seeking the face of God in everything that we do. But if we stop and we begin to look for God to do things instead of looking for God himself, then we will begin to see what we are seeing day in and day out, and we will see all the troubles. See, I think that I don't think that people's heart is in the wrong place, that they are not trying to do right. I think the problem is, is that people are doing wrong because they are, have a lack of knowledge of searching for God. And I say that because I, I truly believe that if I had the idea that every church house in America that was preaching wrong and doing wrong was just searching out to be against God, we would be in a troublesome place. I think that we are seeing a generation of people who are thoroughly confused on what it means to put God first and to seek for God. And we have a responsibility as Christians not just to tell them that, but to show them how it means to seek God first. It is up to us if we want to see that change in our world. So today I want to use a couple of examples of what it means, one, not to seek God and to seek the things of God. But what also it means to seek God. So if you guys would turn with me um, over to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little backstory here um, about somebody most of you guys might know. Because I enjoy preaching about this man. His name is David. Mainly because he was short and cool. Amen. Uh, <laughs> But no, I love preaching about David, but the thing is, is when we preach about David, what do we normally talk about? We talk about Goliath and how he went out and how he killed a, a bear and a lion with his bare hands and all these things and, and, and saved a sheep. And then we talk about Goliath and how he took down a giant. But the reason I love this scripture that, that we're about to go through is because David was a man after God's own heart. He said so himself, but David had problems, amen? David had a lot of problems. But then there was this time when David, when he was, uh, when he was king, and he had went out, and he was, uh, he was standing on a balcony, and he looked down on this balcony, and he saw a woman taking a bath. Her name was Bathsheba. I've always thought it was ironic that her name starts with bath. Amen? Anyway, <laughs> that's my comedy for the day. But he saw her there. She was, she was taking a bath, and he saw, and, and he liked that he saw Bathsheba. And so what did he do? He said, take Call and get Bathsheba and bring her to me. And David went in there and the word says that he knew her. And then Bathsheba became pregnant. Now Bathsheba was already married. I'm just giving some backstory because if we read all the scripture, we'd be here all day long, all right? But he went in there, he got her pregnant, and Bathsheba was already married to somebody by the name of Uriah. All right, I like it. She was married to Uriah. Uriah was a soldier. And whenever he found out that Bathsheba was pregnant, he tried to trick Uriah into bringing in his wife and making, her think, making him think that it was his child and all this jazz. But it didn't work. So what did David do? He sent Uriah out to the front lines 
just to be murdered so that way David wouldn't have to deal with the guilt of what he had already done. And it worked. And then afterwards, David married Bathsheba, and they were together. But this is the part that I want us to focus on, because you've got to remember that David was a man after God's own heart, but David was making some mistakes here. David was anointed as king before all of this happened, but David was still making a mistake. I want you to hear me today. We're not always going to get it right. We're not always going to seek for God. Sometimes we're going to get a little selfish and we're going to seek after the things of God, even whenever we're trying to get it right. And David, he went in there and he was walking down uh, this hallway or whatever, and uh, a man by the name of Nathan came up to David and he looked at him and he says, Hey, listen, God's seen what you're doing. God's seen what has happened. God has seen what is going on right here. And he looked at him and he said, I want you to understand something, though, that God forgives you for what you have done. He will not harm you, but he says, but the child that you have brought forth in this sinful nature is going to die. And David did what David knew best. He got before the face of God. So 2 Samuel chapter 2, or 2 Samuel chapter 12 in verse 16, it says, and this was right after he told him that he was going to, and then the, the, the child had fell sick. It says, David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted, and went in and lay night upon the earth. And the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not neither did he eat, uh, sorry, sorry, but he would not neither did he eat bread with them. David was in a pickle. David was living life the way that David wanted to live. And then when everything went wrong, David said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this back to God. Can I tell you, sometimes we put ourselves in holes and we think, well, God, I'm just going to need you to get me out of this. See, just like this instance of David, he was not beginning to seek God. He was beginning to seek the things of God. He realized that he had messed up and he went out and he got before God and he said, God, I need you to fix this problem. But can I tell you, my God does not work like a genie in a lamp that sits on a shelf. Just because we do something wrong does not mean that we get to go up there, open our Bibles, knock the dust off and say, God, I'm, I'm sorry, I've done all this stuff wrong. I need you to fix all of this. Sometimes the things that we do in this earth cause problems in things in this earth, and there's just nothing that we can do about it. But can I tell you that my God still loves us enough that he will forgive us, just like Nathan was telling David here. He says he forgives you, he loves you and everything, but you still have to pay for the problems that you brought upon yourself in this earth. There's still a problem, and sometimes we think that when we seek the things of God, and God doesn't answer those, that God is just there to punish us. But can I tell you something this morning, that if we continually seek after the face of God instead of the things of God, we don't have to worry about those problems. Just like Job, everything was taken away from him, but he still knew that God was in control. That God still, and why? Because Job kept God first. Had Job went and did everything that everyone else had said, and he just rebuked God and died, could you imagine how different that would have ended? But instead, he kept God first. And so in this story, I know it's a tragic story, and I, and I know it's so sad to think about the situation. But I love what God told him here. He's like, I still love you. Just because you're not seeking after me and you just want me to do what you want me to do and you've just been living this life and all these things doesn't mean that I love you any less than I loved you before. David was still the anointed king. God had every right to go in there and say, you know what? You don't deserve to sit on that throne. I'm going to take it away from you. God had every right to go in there and say, this is no longer your thing. It's mine. But God says, I have still called you for a purpose. Just because we have missed the mark and are seeking the things of God and not seeking God does not mean that God has taken away the calling that he's placed in our life. The word even tells us the complete opposite, that when God puts a calling in our life, it is still our calling in life. Amen? But this is a perfect example of where sometimes we're just going to get it wrong. David got it real, real wrong that day. But David got up from that situation, and he moved forward, and we all know the story and how it goes. And, well, David was a great king. He had gotten it wrong, but when he got back up, God was able to continue to use him. I want us to understand something, that if we've not been seeking God, but we've just been seeking the works of God, 
All it takes is for us to change our mindset and to change our outlook and to begin to seek the the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, and he'll take care of the rest. Now, it doesn't mean that things aren't going to get a little scary. I'm going to tell you right now, tomorrow if I lose my job, I'm going to be a little stressed. But I know that if I seek God first and I'm faithful to him, he's going to provide. It's not a challenge, God. Just FYI. (laughs) <laughs> sometimes you gotta be real with God because he's got a sense of humor, amen uh, <laughs> you'd be like, well here's a box no, um, but see, David, he got it wrong and he was seeking the things of God but he was not seeking God at this moment and there are many times in the Bible where, God, where David was seeking God and that's why I love David because you can use, I mean I could have just went this whole sermon on David but I won't but I want to talk about what happens when we get it right What happens when we actually seek God first? Because it's a beautiful thing, amen? I want to talk about a woman in the book of 1 Samuel, and actually Dad uh, kind of referenced her this morning, or pastor referenced her this morning. I thought I was going to have to just change everything up, but he stayed out of my notes. But in the book of 1 Samuel, in the first chapter, there's a woman that we meet whose name is Hannah. And Hannah was married to a a man, a priest, and um, the the word says that Hannah was not able to have children. It says the Lord had closed her womb. So God had not opened her womb for her to be able to have a child. And Hannah, for many years, was very upset and very hurt that she was not able to have a child. And so she went to the temple one day, and she walked up, and as she was going up to the temple, she went and she began to pray to God. And she made a vow to God. She said, God, if you will bless me with a child, and the word says a man-child or a boy, but if you will bless me with a man-child, God, I will devote his life to you. I will do everything. And, And what I love about Hannah is in this entire time, the word teaches us that she was devout to her husband, that she loved God, and that she was doing everything right, but just everything wasn't working out the way that she thought that it was going to work out. But she was continuing to seek God first. But she didn't say, God, I demand a child right now. God, I need this. She said, God, if you would be so willing to give me a child, I will devote his life 100% to you. Basically, what she was saying is once the child was of age, she would take him up to the temple. She would let the priests and everybody else raise her child, and she would never really get to see him except for about once a year whenever they came out and, and whatnot. And she said, I will give him unto you. And I love in the story that it tells us that, that uh, Hannah, she had went up to the temple, though, and when she was praying, she was praying so much that uh, uh, Eli, one of the priests, came up to her, and he almost rebuked her and says, why are you drunk? And sit at the temple gates. And she looked at him, and she explained everything. She says, I'm not drunk. I believe in my own paraphrasing. She says, I'm just passionate that I know, that I know, that I know that my God is listening to me. And I love what Eli looked at her and he said, he said, all right, well, go and be faithful. And my God has heard your prayers. And I love what the word says. We're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19. And it says, and they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah and Elkanah. And Elkanah, her husband, knew his wife and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time has come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all of his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. This is a good situation of where we get it right sometimes. Hannah was seeking after God. She was seeking the face of God, and she said, God, if you would just hear me. Can I tell you something today? That when we are seeking the face of God, the word tells us that he will give us the desires of our heart. The problem is is we use the word that God will give us the desires of our heart in a way that doesn't really work. (laughs) Well, God's going to give me the desires of my heart. Yeah, but you kind of have to serve him. (laughs) There's a little bit of an obligation there on our part. 
But Hannah, she was truly seeking God, and so God was giving her the desires of her heart when he blessed her with this child. And can I tell you today that sometimes we miss the mark because God will give us the desires of our heart, and then we become selfish again after God gives us those desires. But Hannah, she stood true to God, and she says, okay, you've blessed me with this child, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do exactly what I told you that I would do. And then the word goes on, and she says that she went up to the gates after, the, after he was of age, and she gave him to the priests. And we're reading the book of 1 Samuel, and I guess you could just tell that Samuel did some great things. But here's the problem we face sometimes. We go up and we get a promise from God, but the promise doesn't come along quick enough sometimes. So we say, God, I'm going to take it into my own hands. Get, look at Abraham and Isaac. God says, I'm going to give you a child, and he's going to make your, numbers, uh, the, uh, your seed as big as the, the sand in the sea. So what did he do? He took upon his handmaiden instead of his wife because his wife was old and she couldn't bear children anymore. But God said, that wasn't my plan. Can I tell you something? We need to stop trying to take the plan of God and putting it into our own hands and let God be God sometimes. Sometimes when God is being God, it takes time. We're not ready for those things. The word doesn't tell us how long it took for her to get pregnant, but the word says that in the due time that she did become with child. Sometimes we say, well, God, you promised this to me, so I need it right now. And we begin to take it, and we begin to seek the things of God instead of seeking God himself. But Hannah, she had it right this, morning, this, this day. She went up there, and she was seeking the face of God, and God blessed her. And then when God delivers, we have to be obedient on his promises, too. I can't tell you how many times in my life I felt like, man, God... You've promised this to me, God. You've, you've, you've told me that you're going to take care of me. You're going to do all these things. But then I'm like, but I could just do this so much faster. <laughs> There's a lot of things in this life that I want. I know I could probably get a second job and I could pay for all those things a lot quicker. But I'm going to trust God. I truly believe there's things in this life that I don't have because I probably don't need them. <laughs> Probably why it doesn't give me too much hunting land, amen? It'd be like, it'd be like, if I give you that much land that close to home, it's probably not good, you know? <laughs> but God provides for me. God loves me. God loves you. But we are supposed to seek first the kingdom of God. And I think all this came to me because we were doing the baby dedication and the story of Hannah just came to my heart. But the point here is that Hannah wasn't seeking just for a child. She was seeking to please God. Can I tell you today that if your first thought is how can I please myself before how can I please God, you're probably not seeking the things, or you're not probably not seeking the face of God. You're seeking the things of God. I'm going to tell you right now, when it comes to being a child of God and being a Christian, you just can't have your cake and eat it too. Hmm. Tried it, doesn't usually work. But whenever you are seeking the face of God, it is just as good as having our cake and eating it too because I can tell you that there is no better joy than knowing that everything that I am doing is pleasing to my God. I have no greater peace in my life than when I can put my head down at the end of the day and say, God, I know that I have served you well today. There is no better sleep you will get in your life than knowing that you have put your complete and total trust in God. And Hannah, she was truly seeking after God. And here's my whole point in this sermon today, and I think this is the point that God was uh, really trying to impress in my heart and bring upon this. You know, when we truly seek the face of God, it's not just all about the work. It's not just all about the, the sacrifice and everything. There is great reward when we truly seek after the face of God. And I'm not just talking about in our life. I'm just talking about in general. There is big reward. We've been talking a lot about uh, uh, revivals. I know we have a revival in October that, we're, uh, that, that uh, Sister Cindy and Blake have been working with uh, Brother Tim, and we're trying to get that going, and I'm so excited about it. But I think the whole reason this has been on my heart is because how can we expect to revive something? Because to have a revival is to revive something, bring something back to life. 
if we can't stop getting in our own way and letting God be God? How can we let God be God if all we want is for him to be who we want him to be? We have to be willing to seek the face of God and not just seek what we want from God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, and this is what I mean. I want us to go there, and if you, if you got a highlighter, you might want to highlight it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, wait, I'm going to wait. I hear a lot of crumblies. Oh, yeah, that's a beautiful sound. I'll wait all, listen, I'll wait all day. I like it. I sound something the other day. I love just a nice paper, good book. Like, I can't do, like, e-books very well. I get distracted. Like, I'll, I'll be honest, there's a bunch of times I was like, oh, let me read this scripture because whatever. And then Facebook popped up. I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but it just it happened so fast. And all of a sudden, here I am, seeing everybody's posts. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek my God is a rewarder of those who seek after him. My God will reward you and he will give you the desires of your heart if you are seeking after him. And so when we're talking about revival, can I tell you something? That revival doesn't start in a park. It doesn't start in a church. It, doesn't, it starts in our heart. Amen? If we are truly seeking after the face of God, then revival can set off inside of our hearts and revive something that needs to be revived, and that is that Holy Spirit fire just being within us in everything that we do. You want to know why you can tell that people aren't seeking after God? And it's just like I said in the beginning, when we have churches fighting against churches, can I tell you something today? That if you serve a God that says, I sent my son to die on the cross, and he rose three days later, amen, and that he is the son of God, then you serve the same God that I do. I don't care if you sit down during praise and worship. I don't care if you say hoopla and you run the streets, amen. We serve the same God. So if we are seeking after the same thing, then why can't we both work together in order to see the kingdom of God filled? Amen? Church, we need to be on fire for the, the face of God and not the things of God. Because when we are looking after him and looking towards him in his righteousness, he will take care of everything else. But not only that, he'll reward us. He will give us the desires of our heart. I'll be honest with you, sometimes I, I sit there and I think, man, God, I don't deserve any of this. And I am 100% right. But I know that I know that I know that I have what I have because I keep God first. That is not a boastful statement because I get it wrong way more times than I should, amen? And if there's a Christian out there that says they don't get it wrong, they just got it wrong. <laughs> That's what we call a lie. <laughs> but church how are we going to seek God's face if all we want is for God to do what we want him to do every day I wake up I won't say every day because sometimes I wake up five minutes before I'm supposed to log into my computer and I miss the mark there but I wake up and I say God today God, I just want to do what you want me to do. Can I tell you something? If you change your prayer from God, I need you to do this and that, to God, I want you to do whatever it is you want to do in my life today, can I tell you right now that your life will forever change? Can I tell you right now you will see God do more work in your life with a prayer of sacrifice than you will a prayer of need? Can I tell you today that my God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. He draws near to those who draw near to him, and he draws nigh to those who draw nigh to him. My God says that if you knock and you ask, he will answer and he will open that door. But we have to put him first. The problem is, is that we're, we're so good at putting him second, 
And third, it's saying, well, God, you know, you just do this. The question is, is are we really seeking God today? And you might be saying, yeah, I am. Good. Show someone else how it means to seek after the face of God. Church, we have an obligation in this lost and dying world to be an example of what it means to seek after God. All the time, people will ask me some questions, and I'm like, it's just, it's just not what it's supposed to be. You know, I'm, I'll be, the, like, for instance, my car. <laughs> I've got a nice car. Well, okay, I, I got a car that runs. It's, it's okay. I've got to put the door handle back on because my wife got angry and ripped it off. Um, but she didn't say she didn't rip it off. It's got some quirks. But you know what? I know that my God has blessed me with something that's going to continue to run and continue to do what it needs to do. I don't need nothing fancy in life. I told someone this yet the other day. I don't care how much money is in my bank account. If I'm not pleasing God with it, I don't want it. I don't care if I have the biggest house, the biggest mansion, and all this stuff. I don't care if I have a thousand friends. I've got, I've got very few friends as far as, like, you know, compared to my Facebook count. <laughs> but I don't care to have that many friends. I want to have people in this world that know who I am and know what I serve or know who I serve and what I am about. If they want to be my friend, I'll be their friend. I don't need all that extra stuff, but I don't need people that bring me away from the glory of God. I've had friends like that in my life, and I don't need them. So really, the easy way to know if you are seeking after God or if you are seeking after the things of God is to know that if you say, God, in every single thing that I do, is it bringing you glory? Because I can tell you right now, if you are seeking God and not the things of God, your prayer will be, God, I want to glorify you in everything that I do, and I want to see your kingdom grow. I've, played, I've prayed plenty of prayers seeking things of God. And then I look at myself, I'm like, well, that, yeah, that probably wasn't good. My God will give me my desires, but I want to see his kingdom grow, and I want to see him glorified. So what are we seeking after today, church? If y'all would stand with me for just a moment, I'm going to have Mallory come to the piano again, wrap things up here in just a moment. Sometimes I think we overcomplicate our Christian walk. Sometimes I think we overcomplicate what it means to truly seek after God. And the honest truth is that it's just as simple as everything else. If you wake up in the morning and say, God, today, I want to give you glory. God, today, I want everything that I do to bring you glory. You Listen, I'm telling you right now, you don't have to have your Bible in your hand every second of every day. You don't have to be at church every second of every day. You don't have to be doing all these things every second of every day. You can glorify God at your workplace. Amen. You can glorify God walking through Walmart. You can glorify God going through the McDonald's drive through amen? See, it's not always about everything that we say and all those things, but it's about who we are. The Word says that we will be peculiar people amongst the world, right? When people see me, they should see something different in me. And if they're seeing something different in me, then I'm probably seeking after the Word, which says I'm seeking after God church every day we should ask God God what can I do to glorify you and if you just keep God first everything else will fall into place I'm gonna tell you right now if your marriage is struggling put God first if your finances are struggling put God first I'll tell you right now if your walk is struggling with the with God put God first it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be pleasurable. It's not always going to be fun. But I can guarantee you that it works. Because I've been there. I've been on both sides of the aisle. And I can guarantee you one side doesn't and one side does. But you know what I love about my God? Is that even when we get it wrong, He is still faithful to us. 
He still loves us. He still cherishes us just as much as whenever we get down on the altar and we ask for him his forgiveness. He loves us just as much when we were living in that sinful nature. He doesn't love where we're at and what we're doing, but he still loves us. I struggle a lot of times when people tell me that uh, I'm not going to get in this whole debate and whatnot about who God loves and all these things and whatnot. Can I tell you that John 3, 16 puts it very plain that God loves everybody. So that way, all who accept Jesus Christ in their life can come and know and have eternal life. I choose to believe that my God loves everybody. I don't care how bad you are, how good you are. My God loves you enough that he sent his son to die on the cross so that way you could live with him. That is the God I serve. That is the God that I choose to proclaim in the streets and tell people about. That's my God. That's your God. So today as she's playing, these altars are open for each and every one of us. But I want to challenge you to examine your life today and ask yourself, what am I looking for? Am I looking to please God? Am I looking to seek the kingdom of God first? Or am I looking for God to take care of something that I have caused? Am I looking for God to just do what I want him to do instead of being God in my life? And I want to challenge you that if, say, maybe you're missing the mark, maybe we're just not seeking God the way we should, let's not leave today that same way that we came in. Let's leave today seeking God more than ever before. Let's leave today knowing that we are putting God first in every single thing that we do. And watch what God can do. I don't believe we'd have to wait till October for a revival to break out, amen? Hey, I believe that my God is still in the revival business. I believe my God is still moving and still working just as much today as he was that day when the word says that they were in one mind and one accord and they were adding thousands to the church on daily. Let me tell you something, my God can still do it we just have to be willing to put him first and get ourselves out of the way. Church, let's let God be God today.